Welcome to Lecture 20 of BIB 201 Bible Doctrines 1. Today's lecture is going to be finishing up the section on the nature of God by discussing God as a Trinity, and then we will start on the Holy Spirit. So let's begin. Picking up where we left off in our last lecture, we're on letter D. God is a Trinity. Another name for this is a tri-unity. Three separate but equal unified in one. Now, this is a mystery, Paul calls this. This is something that we do not completely understand, although it is still taught in the Word of God. Number one, some things to know about God as a Trinity is that the Old Testament suggests this doctrine, but does not directly declare it. And there are various ways how it is suggested in the Old Testament, but again, not directly declared. Letter A, it is suggested by the plural name for God, Elohim. And as I mentioned in a previous lecture, when Elohim is used referring to God, the Father, Son, or Spirit, the verb that is used afterward, in spite of the fact that Elohim is plural, the verb is always singular, showing that compound unity. And not, so not only is the name Elohim suggested, for the doctrine of the Trinity, but letter B. It is suggested by the plural forms of the personal pronoun for God. Two really important and popular times whenever this is used is Genesis 1 6 when God said, Let us make man in our image. Now, some people have tried to incorrectly assume that this is referring to God and the angels. However, angels are not mentioned in Genesis 1 or Genesis 2. The first mention of an angel is not done until Genesis 3, after the fall of Adam and Eve. So the us there must refer to the Trinity, God the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Another example is Genesis 11:7. 7, whenever the Tower of Babel is being built, God said, let us go down and visit the people and let us confuse their language. And then lastly, Isaiah 6 verse 8, God is speaking here, says, who will go for us? And again, this could not be referencing the angels or any other beings because of the pronoun antecedent agreement in those passages. Then letter C, it is suggested by the Theophanies and the angel of the Lord. Now, in the Old Testament, there are sometimes, not every time, but sometimes when an angel of the Lord will appear to an individual and speak to them as they are God. The fact that they're called the angel of the Lord and referring to themselves in the first person as God shows that this is not just an angel. This is a separate person of the Godhead. This is either a theophany or a Christophany. And there's two examples that are given there um, various times that are used in the Old Testament. There's many more, but there are two examples. Then letter D. It is suggested by the works of the Holy Spirit. Now, in Genesis 1, verses 1 and 2, the most popular one says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. So this is where I mentioned that it is suggested in the Old Testament, but not directly declared. So you have God the Father in verse 1, and then the Spirit in verse 2. And of course we know Jesus is not specifically mentioned there, but Paul is going to tell us later that without Jesus there would have been no creation as well. And then lastly, letter E, the Trisagion. The Trisagion seems to indicate the Trinity. Now this one I put as a little bit of a question because I put it seems to indicate. And the reason why that is is because in Isaiah 6 verse 3 it says, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Now, these are angels flying around the throne of God saying repeatedly, holy, holy, holy. Now there's two ways to look at this. One could be the tris, three, agion, holies, are being said one for the Father, one for the Son, and one for the Spirit. Or, as many of us know, 
in the Old Testament Hebrew mindset, a way to show emphasis was to say something three times. So this could just be emphasizing the holiness of God. So that's why I say it seems to indicate, but this one may actually be more of a indication of the holiness of God and stressing that holiness in a Hebrew mindset than necessarily declaring the Trinity in the Old Testament. And while the doctrine of the Trinity is suggested in the Old Testament, it is explicitly declared in the New Testament. And there are various ways it is explicitly declared in the New Testament. The first is that it is declared at the baptism of Christ. All three persons of the Godhead are represented at Jesus' baptism in Matthew chapter 3. You have Jesus, the Son of God, being baptized. God the Father speaking from heaven and saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And then you have the Spirit of God descending like a dove gracefully upon Jesus. So right there, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. And then letter B. It is declared in the baptismal formula. Now, the Great Commission contains the baptismal formula in Matthew 28, 19, and 20. We are told that we are supposed to go and teach all nations, make disciples. And then after a while we're going and making disciples, those disciples are supposed to be baptized. How? In the name of the Father, and in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Spirit. So those three right there, Father, Son, and Spirit, are showed together in the baptismal formula explicitly declared. Then letter C is declared in what's called the apostolic benediction. That is just a big way of saying the Apostle Paul's farewell to the church of, in Corinth in 2 Corinthians 13, 14, where he declares the grace of the Lord Jesus and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. So all three persons of the Godhead, Lord Jesus, love of God, fellowship of the Holy Spirit. And then letter D, it is declared in the teachings of Jesus. Now, this is just one example of that, but in John chapter 14, verse 16, he says, I will pray the Father, so there's the first person, God the Father, and he, of course we have Jesus speaking here, God the Son, he will give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. That other comforter is the Holy Spirit. So the Father, Son, and Spirit are all shown right there. And we're actually going to come back to this that, that word another is a very important word that we will come back to and explain in another um, slide. Now let's look at letter E. It is also declared in the teachings of the New Testament. And three main things about this is number one, the Father is called God in Romans 1, 7. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. Not only is the Father called God, but number two, the Son is called God. Hebrews 1.8, but unto the Son, he says, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. And then lastly, you guessed it, the Spirit is called God. And in Acts chapter 5, verses 3 and 4, this is when Ananias lies about the offering that he's giving to the church. And Peter confronts him about this lie and says that he's lied to the Holy Spirit. And by lying to the Holy Spirit, you've not lied to men, but you've lied to to God. So explicitly in the New Testament, the Father is called God, the Son is called God, and the Spirit is called God. Now, they are not three separate gods. They are one God, three persons of the Godhead, but one God. If that thought confuses you, then you're exactly where you need to be. To understand this would be to be equal to God. It is not something that we necessarily get but it's something that we understand is completely and explicitly taught in the scriptures. Now, because of that, I've got a little bit of a funny video to show you that will help explain a little bit about the Trinity and also shed some light on some false examples and symbolism that we use to try to explain the Trinity. Okay, Patrick, tell us a bit more about this Trinity thing. Yeah, Patrick, tell us. But remember that we're simple people without your fancy education and books and learning, and we're hearing about all of this for the first time, so try to keep it simple, okay, Patrick? Yeah, real simple, Patrick. 
Sure, there are uh, three persons of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, yet there is only one God. Don't get what you're saying here, Patrick. Not picking up what you're laying down here, Patrick. Could you use an analogy, Patrick? Sure. Uh, the Trinity is like uh, water and how you can find water in three different forms, liquid and ice and vapor. That's modalism, Patrick! What? Modalism, an ancient heresy confessed by teachers such as Noetus and Sibelius, which espouses that God is not three distinct persons, but that he merely reveals himself in three different forms. This heresy was clearly condemned in Canon 1 at the First Council of Constantinople in 381 AD, and those who confess it cannot rightly be considered a part of the Church Catholic. Come on, Patrick! Yeah, get it together, Patrick! Uh, okay, uh, then the Trinity is like uh, the sun in the sky, where you have the star and the light and the heat. Oh, Patrick. Come on, Patrick. That's Arianism, Patrick. Arianism? Yes, Arianism, Patrick. A theology which states that Christ and the Holy Spirit are creations of the Father and not one in nature with him. Exactly like how heat and light are not the star itself, but are merely creations of the star. That's a bad analogy, Patrick. You're the worst, Patrick. All right, sorry. The Trinity is like uh, this three-leaf clover here. I'm going to stop you right there, Patrick. Yeah, hold your horses, Patrick. You're about to confess partialism. Partialism? Yes, partialism, a heresy which asserts that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are not distinct persons of the Godhead, but are different parts of God, each composing one-third of the divine. And who confesses the heresy of partialism? The first season of the cartoon program Voltron, where five robot lion cars merge together to form one giant robot samurai, obviously... I've never heard of Voltron. Of course you haven't. It's not going to exist for another 1,500 years now, Patrick. Yeah, get with the program, Patrick. I mean, really, Patrick. I'm going to stab you in the face, Patrick. Okay, that was probably a bit much. All right, I'll try again. Uh, the Trinity is like how the same man can be a husband and a father and an employer. Modalism again. All right, then it's like the three layers of an apple. Partialism revisited. Fine. The Trinity is a mystery which cannot be comprehended by human reason, but is understood only through faith and is best confessed in the words of the Athanasian Creed, which states that we worship one God in Trinity and Trinity in unity, neither confusing the persons nor dividing the substance, that we are compelled by the Christian truth to confess that each distinct person is God and Lord, and that the deity of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is one, equal in glory, co-equal in majesty. Well, why didn't you just say that, Patrick? Yeah, quit beating around the bush, Patrick. Now let's all put on some giant green foam hats, get riotously drunk, and vomit in the Chicago River to celebrate our conversion. <laughs> So what do you guys do for a living? Well, we come from a long line of snake farmers, Patrick, but truth be told, business has been real bad lately. Oh. Yeah, about that. Okay, well now that we have that explained in a very humorous way, um, and if you did not get the very end joke of that about the snakes, I would challenge you to Google St. Patrick and snakes and you'll get a really funny story that will explain why the business has been down for snake farming. But um, let's move on to Roman numeral five. We're going to talk about the Holy Spirit. Now typically pneumatology, which is the theological term for Holy Spirit, is its own separate doctrine. But because of the way this course is laid out, we don't have a separate time for pneumatology. I'm going to actually place it with theology proper again, not taking away from the Godhead of the Holy Spirit, but just for sake of time and the way the course is laid out. So let's look at some of the aspects of the Holy Spirit. Letter A, the personality of the Holy Spirit. Now there are various things in the New Testament that help explain and shed light on the personality of the Holy Spirit. The first thing that we'll discuss is that he is masculine. Now, in the New Testament, the word spirit is pneuma, which is in the Greek, a neuter word. In English, we don't necessarily have the same connotations, but in the Greek, you have masculine, you have feminine, and you have neuter. Now, that's an interesting thing to point out because if the Holy Spirit is neuter, 
why are masculine pronouns always used with him? Now, if you look at John 14, verse 16, it says, And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. This pronoun, he, is in the masculine, showing that even though the spirit is neuter, he is masculine. The reason why the Bible does this is because it's trying to di differentiate between an abstract idea. The Holy Spirit is not just a part of God. He is God. It's not just an abstract idea. He's a real being. That is why the New Testament attributes him masculine pronouns, even though spirit is neuter. Now, some people would like to say that there's one exception, which is Romans 8.26, and the spirit, pray, the spirit itself prays for us. However, the King James mistranslates that word itself, because in the Greek, in every manuscript of the Greek, that word is masculine. The Spirit himself prays for us. So not only is he masculine, but number two, he is our comforter, our comforter. The Greek word that is used here, and we just saw it a second ago, I'll pray the Father and send another comforter, is the word paraclete. And paraclete means one called alongside. It's translated comforter or advocate. A few things to point out about the Holy Spirit being our comforter, letter A. As comforter, he is equal to God. The Lord said he would send another comforter. Now, in the Greek, there are two words used for another. Alos, which means another of the same kind, and heteros, which means another of a different kind. The one used here is alos, meaning that the Holy Spirit will be another comforter of the same kind as Jesus in the Godhead. And then letter B, as comforter, he is God. 1 John 2, verse 1, My dear children, writing to you this you will not sin, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate, a comforter, who pleads our case before the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. Now here, Jesus is being called the comforter, the advocate, but what does Jesus call the Holy Spirit? Another comforter of the same kind. Therefore, by Jesus being called God here as a comforter, the Holy Spirit, by Jesus' statement and inference, is called God as well. And of course, don't forget about Acts chapter 4 when Peter directly declared lying to the Holy Spirit is lying to God because again, he is God. And then number three, he has characteristics of personality ascribed to him. And if you remember the three characteristics of personality, the first one is knowledge. He has knowledge. In fact, he has a plethora of knowledge because he's God. He's all-knowing. One example of this is in John 14, verse 26. In this passage it says, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. One of the ministries of the Holy Spirit with the disciples was to help them remember everything Jesus said. He would bring it to their remembrance, and he would teach them all that Jesus said. Because again, following Jesus for three years, they would have forgotten some information. That is why John says at the end of his gospel that there's so much more that Jesus did. If they'd have written it all down, he hyperbolically says the world would not be able to contain the books written therein. So with the Holy Spirit's help, he helped them remember so they could accurately record what Jesus taught. But not only does he have knowledge, but let it be, he has a will. He has a will and a desire. One of the greatest verses that talk about his will is in 1 Corinthians 12, 11. Here it says, All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit, Holy Spirit, who apportions to each one individually as he wills. Now, the context of this passage is talking about spiritual gifts. Every single believer has been given at least one, some more, of the, of the spiritual gifts. Everyone has one. No one has them all, but everyone has at least one. How did you get your spiritual gift? Well, it was based off of the will of the Holy Spirit. How he willed it is how you got your spiritual gift. But not only does the Holy Spirit have knowledge, he has will, but he also has, letter C, he has emotions. Now, 
out of any of them, we see the emotions of the Spirit detailed more than the Father and even the Son. But as guys, again, remember, he's called our Comforter. So I've devoted an entire section at the end of these notes to talk about the emotions of the Holy Spirit, like how he can be grieved and insulted and lied to. But we'll get to that in another lecture. Number four, he also has personal relationship with others. There are four main groups that I would like to point out that hold the Holy Spirit has a personal relationship with. The first, letter A, is he has a relationship with the Father and the Son. This can be seen in various passages. We can see this in the Apostolic Benediction of 2 Corinthians 13, 14. You can see this in the Baptism of Formula. You can see this in the Baptism of Christ. All these places show that he has a relationship with the Father and with the Son. But not only that, he has a special relationship, letter B, with Jesus. In John 16, verse 13, he declares that he will point all men to Jesus. If you've ever wondered why there's so little in the Bible about directly about the Holy Spirit, it's because he has inspired the Word of God. And because he's inspired it, he is pointing people, according to John, to Jesus. And if you're trying to get someone to come to know an individual, you don't focus on yourself, you focus on them. That's why the Bible is full of passages directly and indirectly about Jesus, but we have to really research and study passages about the Holy Spirit. And then letter C, he has a relationship with the apostles. Not just a relationship with Jesus, but a relationship with apostles. Same verse here, John 16 verse 13 says, When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and will declare to you the things that are to come. So again, you see both aspects there. The Holy Spirit pointing people to Jesus and the Holy Spirit helping those apostles remember what the Lord had said so they could accurately record God's will for the church. And then lastly, letter D, he has a relationship with believers. One of my favorite verses in the entire Bible is Romans 8, 26. And in Romans 8, 26, it says, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with the groanings too deep for words. When you and I get to the point where we don't even know what to pray or how to pray or how to vocalize how we're feeling, thankfully, Paul declares in the book of Romans that the Holy Spirit intercedes for us. He says, it's okay, I've got this. I know exactly what you need and I know how to bring it to the Father. Well, that brings us to the end of Lecture 20 for BIB 201, Bible Doctrines 1. I hope you enjoyed it. If you have any questions or need anything, please do not hesitate to contact me.